Oh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dana Gully, and I am the manager of outreach and volunteer programs at Riverkeeper. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us for today's webinar, Back to School on GEPCBs, which will be presented by Abigail Jones of Riverkeeper, Daniel Rachel with NRDC, and Joseph Rappaport with the Campaign for Cleaner Hudson. A couple of very quick housekeeping items. Um, this webinar is being recorded, so we will be able to share the recorded version of it with you later this week so that you can share it with folks or come back to it and watch it again um, if you're planning on taking notes. And also, all attendees are on mute. We will have time at the end for a question and answer session, um, and we really do encourage you to ask your questions. Um, you can do so at any time during the presentation by typing them into the question box, which is located on your webinar panel. There's a little box that says questions. So type them in whenever you have one, and then we will get to them um, at the end. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Abigail. Abby? Thanks, Dana. This is Abby Jones. I'm a staff attorney, attorney with Riverkeeper. Um, I've been dealing with the GEPCB's case for about three years, my entire time at Riverkeeper. So we're just going to get started now. Um, I'm going to give you a roadmap of the presentation, kind of let you know where we're going. I'm going to start off, and then I'm going to turn it over to Dan and Joe at the end. So first up, what has GE done to remove PCBs from the Hudson River? Then we'll talk about what GE is leaving behind. What does this mean for the Hudson River? What are GE's legal liabilities for the Hudson River? And what you can do to help. So the Hudson River Superfund, GE and General Electric had factories in Hudson Falls and Fort Edward, New York. And over the course of 30 years from the 1940s to the 1970s, they dumped at least 1.3 million pounds of PCBs in the Hudson River. In 1984, the Hudson River was designated the largest Superfund site in the United States, with almost the entire Hudson River from Hudson Falls to the Battery in New York City as being part of the Superfund site. Now, Dan will get into this a bit later as he talks about legal liabilities, but basically, Superfund is a name given to the federal law that requires the cleanup of the nation's most contaminated site. So the GE cleanup, um, what GE is actually required to remove from the Hudson River, the PCBs, is only limited to the upper 40 miles of the Hudson River from Fort Edwards um, and Hudson Falls to the federal dam at Troy. So under this remediation, there is absolutely no remediation, no dredging of PCBs south of the Troy Dam. That's a very important thing to know because what you're dealing with below the river then is source removal being the important part of the remediation. And quickly, just a legal timeline of the history of the Superfund site. In 1984, the Superfund site was designated by the US EPA. In 2002, the record of decision was signed, and this is where EPA and GE chose the selected in-river dredging remedy. 2006 and 2009 both saw consent decrees in the um, in which GE agreed to do the phased dredging, um, which I'll get into a bit later. Oops, sorry. In 2012, there was a five-year review in which EPA took a took a look at what GE had done so far and made a determination of whether or not what they were doing was still good. This year is the anticipated end of dredging for the upper 40 miles, and in 2016. GE is going to decommission the dewatering facility, remove all its equipment from Fort Edward and from the river, and finish habitat restoration. So what are PCBs? PCBs are polychlorinated biphenyls, which were widely used as a fire preventative and insulator in the manufacture of electrical devices, like transformers and capacitors. The manufacture of PCBs was banned in the US in the late 1970s. So they are man-made organic chemicals, and they are, um, their industrial use properties include non-flammability, chemically stable, high boiling point. All of these things make it so that PCBs take a very, very long time to degrade in the natural environment. Here's just some pictures of the PCBs. So continuing on with what PCBs are. 
PCB is built up or bioaccumulate in the environment and thus increase in concentration as the contamination moves up the food chain. PCBs are considered probable human carcinogens and are linked to other adverse health effects such as low birth weight, thyroid disease, learning and memory and immune system disorders, neurological and hormonal disorders, reproductive dose disorders, and the list goes on and on as you can see here. Now PCBs in the Hudson River affect fish, wildlife, and humans. And this is because PCBs bioaccumulate in fatty tissues and PCB levels in the fish of the Hudson River has been a critical factor in the remediation of the Hudson River PCBs and is a critical issue for the public. This was a statement from the US EPA. So here's just a little diagram showing what I talk what I mean when I talk about bioaccumulation. As you can see, when the PCBs are in the sediment and it moves up the food chain, the um, level of PCBs increases so that when it gets to humans, it's at its largest. So what is the goal for dredging in the Hudson River? The goal of the 2002 record of decision and the whole point of GE being in the river and dredging is to remove the source of PCBs so that the level in fish will decline to quote unquote healthy levels. And according to EPA, active remediation of contaminated sediments is necessary in order to significantly reduce the human health and, and environmental risk. So EPA set a remediation goal for human consumption of PCBs through fish as 0 0.05 milligrams per kilogram in a fish fillet. This equates to a male over 50 being allowed to eat one fish per week. EPA has also issued what's known as risk-based PCB concentrations um, that are 0.4 milligrams per kilogram and 0.2 milligrams per kilogram. Um, and they result in one fish per two months and one fish per one month, respectively. Now, the anticipated timelines in reaching these goals as set forth in the 2002 agreement is that this remediation goal will take 41 years from the start of dredging to reach. Um, and the protectiveness of the selected remedy, which is dredging of the source, has also been based on the continuation of institutional controls. And in particular, what we're talking about here are the fish consumption advisories and fish re fishing restrictions issued by New York State. Now briefly, here's an overview of the New York State Department of Health Fish Consumption Advisories. Since 1976, because of GE's PCB contamination in the Hudson River, New York State has issued a fish consumption advisory, and New York State DOS, Department of, um, I mean DOH, Department of Health, and DEC have also closed various recreational and commercial fisheries. The advisory, as you see here, can briefly be summarized as follows. In the upper Hudson, from Hudson Falls, which was where GE's northernmost plant was located, to the federal dam at Troy, there is a take none, eat none ban on all fish in the Hudson River. From mid-Hudson, from the federal dam at Troy, to the Van uh, Winkle Bridge at Catskill, women under 50 and children still have the eat none ban on fishing, and men over 15 and women over 50 can eat a few species, but it's only one meal per month. And then as you get south of Catskill in the lower Hudson, it gets a little bit more complicated and also a lot more dangerous. And that's because not everyone downriver, unfortunately, is even aware that, you know, PCBs from the upper Hudson are contaminating the river and the fish. And also not everybody is aware of these fish consumption advisories. So down, even downriver, the women um, under 50 and children under 15 still have an, uh, the eat none ban. And you can see that there are certain fish that can have up to one meal per month for men over 15. And for crabs, you can have six crabs a week. So what you, what the, why this is important is because you can't taste or smell PCBs in fish, and there is no immediately immediate health effect. So you're not going to eat a PCB-contaminated fish and throw up. But PCBs, as we saw, 
do persist in the environment and the human body for an extremely long time. And so what piece, what Department of Health has issued, and you'll see here in the lower left, is this little magnet that they hand out saying, cut the fat to cut the PCBs. So this is all that, you know, we have to protect us from um, contaminated fish. So what does this mean in relation to the, the remediation that GE is doing in the Hudson River? So we know that PCBs are cause human health effects. We know that the remediation goal for the dredging is to allow for the safe consumption of, of fish from the Hudson River. So what did EPA and GE come up with to get to that point? So the remedial plan for the Hudson River was that 2.65 million cubic yards of PCB sediment was to be dredged from the upper 40 miles, again, north of the Federal Dam at Troy. This was to be done in two phases and three river sections with varying target levels. So in river section one, which is the northernmost, it was a almost complete bank-to-bank -bank, um, dredging, whereas in river sections two and three, it was more of the dredging of hot spots only. Um, and there's a very detailed dredging plan um, that GE and EPA came up with. There's very limited capping. I think the capping limit is 11% overall. Um, and the remedial plan also includes habitat restoration. So after GE comes in, they dredge the PCBs, they put clean backfill in, they'll then go over and um, plant um, different uh, plants to help maintain that sediment in place. And there's also the reliance on monitored natural attenuation, which means that I mentioned before, PCB safety an extremely long time to break down. So part of this remedy allows for some of the PCBs to be left behind. And I think Dan's going to get into this maybe a bit more, but the selected remedy only takes out 65% of the known PCBs in the upper Hudson. So because there are PCBs being left behind after GE leaves the river, um, they're, they're going to rely on the natural breakdown over decades as part of the remediation plan. So here's just a little picture of how GE uses clamshell buckets to dredge the PCB sediment. They place them on barges. They, they tug the barges upriver to the sea watering facility, which is the bottom picture you see here in Fort Edward. And this is a massive facility. They've built um, unloading wharfs, one, one from the south, one from the north. They have a complete dewatering facility there um, where they press all the water out, which they then filter, um, clean, and put back in the Hudson River. The sediment that's left behind is then uh, wrapped up and shipped by rail out of the state to certified um, landfills that can take this kind of PCB contaminated materials. So that's just a little background of what GE was required to do. And now I'm going to get into um, GE's remediation of the Hudson River by the numbers. What have they done so far? So we're looking at six years and two phases of dredging. Um, this is um, a few years shy of what the initial expectation was, so they're, they're making very good headway. To date, they've dredged 2.7 million cubic yards. Um, their goal was 2.65, and this is because when they actually got in and started dredging, they realized that there's much more contamination at levels deeper than they initially thought. At least 75% of the dredge materials reached TOSCA levels. Toxic Substance Control Act is what TOSCA means. And that's where the levels of PCB are over 50 parts per million. And that's when it has to go, especially to these off-site, out-of-state facilities that are equipped to handle this kind of contaminated materials. I mentioned before that they have an 11% cap limit. They have capped 7.5% overall, which is pretty good. And over 30 acres of total habitat have been seeded and replanted with over 500,000 plants, most of which were locally sourced. The, the bad news is, from our perspective, is that GE is going to be absolutely done with dredging under this remediation plan by October 
2015. And all of this was uh, the latest update from our community advisory group meeting in Schuylerville on August 20, 2015. So where does this leave us? As I mentioned, so far, you could say there's some successes associated with GE's remediation. They've greatly exceeded the expected amount of contaminated sediment to be dredged, and their years have had a schedule. And all of this was done with very little to no exceedances of water quality and air quality. So in these respects, GE has done more in less time without really harming the environment or the local community. So in, insofar as that can be classified as a success, we would probably agree. But there is new information that calls any success that's claimed into question. And I know Dan's going to get into this more, so this is just going to be a brief overview. In May of this year, NOAA, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, who is a federal trustee, which Dan will explain, they found that the river and the Hudson River fish will remain contaminated with much higher levels of PCBs for decades longer. We also found out this year in our CAG meeting in August that GE was doing the fish sampling wrong for over 10 years, which results in a significant underestimation of the PCB levels in the Hudson River fish. And this information is used not only by EPA to determine whether or not the remedy is being successful, but it's also being used or can be used by the Department of Health to set their fish consumption advisories. And also at the CAG meeting, we learned that GE is being allowed by EPA to permanently remove equipment from the river and from the dewatering facility at the present time while questions remain as to the success of the cleanup. And so this, all this new information is on top of a 2011 study by the Federal Natural Resource Damages Trustees, which found that the current remedy will leave behind approximately 136 acres, highly contaminated hotspots in river sections two and three. And leaving these highly contaminated hotspots in the Hudson River threatens to undermine GE's progress even before any of this new information was brought into light. So most of this 136 acres, and our campaign and our organizations have mentioned this time and time again, most of these 136 acres are within 200 feet of the current dredging areas. So we know that GE has the ability to dredge more contaminated sediments more quickly than they ever thought. So it's really not an issue of can they do it. We know they can, and we know they can do it successfully. But as I mentioned, this Dan will go into all this information a little bit uh, more in detail. So that's kind of where we stand um, in a brief background of the remediation. But there are lingering harms and impacts, and more must be done in order for us to have a cleaner river, healthier economies, sooner than our grandchildren's generation. And this includes the Champlain Canal that has been unmaintained by the New York State Canal Corps for over 30 years due to the presence of PCBs in the Champlain Canal. It's extremely expensive to dredge the material no matter what level of PCBs are in there. And it would cost toll payers and taxpayers millions of dollars if New York State was forced to undertake this instead of GE. More must be done because we know, as I just mentioned, as, as we'll hear later, that there is a likely failure to meet the remedial objectives of the cleanup. And this includes adverse impacts to both the recovery of the health of the river and our river-based commercial and recreational opportunities. We also know that the fish consumption advisories have been in effect for 40 years, and they're going to remain in effect with no end in sight. And it could be generations longer than we even anticipated. So we were looking at 40 years. It could be 30, 40, 50 years past that. There's also the potential for resedimentation and transport downriver from these extra PCBs that are going to be left behind in the river. And then the hindrance of natural resource damages assessment projects. And Dan's going to get into this a little bit more. But as I just mentioned, these 136 acres, if, they're, if left behind, are likely to prevent certain restoration projects from being implemented in the river. If the, if the sediment's contaminated, you're not going to be able to put a kayak launch at that spot, for example. 
So what I've done here is I've just kind of tried to provide you with a background of what the Hudson River Superfund site is, what GE was required to do and why, what PCBs are and why we care, and then kind of lead into what Dan will get into more, but where do we go from here and what's GE's legal liabilities? So again, thank you for your time and without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dan. Thanks, Abby. Um, so um, my presentation, well, first, first, my name is Dan Rochelle. I'm a staff attorney at the Natural Resources Defense Council. And uh, my presentation today is going to be on GE's legal responsibility for PCBs in the Hudson River. Some of this is a little bit technical, but I will try to do it um, in a manner that's a little, sort of break down the concepts and is easy to understand. So just to give you a sense of what I'm going to talk about today, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the legal background and essentially uh, to uh, sort of explore what GE is really on the hook for. And um, hopefully that will be my only pun of the presentation. Um, I'm also going to talk about the damage that PCBs have caused to the Hudson River because that's important to the legal liability that GE faces here. Um, I'm going to do sort of what Abby did, sort of where things stand with PCBs and the remedy and all that. And then also uh, my colleague Joe Rappaport is going to talk about um, steps that can be taken and what can be done. Um, so to start off, as Abby mentioned, uh, you know, 200 miles of the Hudson River from Fort Edward, New York, all the way down to the Battery in New York City is a federal Superfund site. But what does that actually mean? Um, well, the Superfund Act goes by another name in the environmental community, and that is the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act. Uh, but before you fall asleep, um, or I should say CERCLA for short, but before you fall asleep, um, I want to remind everybody that the Superfund Act at its base is a very, very simple act. It's kind of like a you mess it up, you clean it up act, or probably better said, uh, you mess it up, you clean it up, and you pay compensation for the damage uh, that your mess has caused. Um, so to sort of break that down a little bit, there are two bases of liability that a polluter faces under the Superfund Act. The first, which um, we probably all know about, is the cost of a removal or remedial action. And in essence, this is just getting the toxic stuff out of the resource that the polluter put into that resource, basically removing contamination from the environment. And there's a, a standard here. The polluter has to remove enough contamination from the environment to assure protection of human health and the environment, a very good standard. But in addition to that liability, there is a second basis of liability. Um, and this is more based on restoration and compensation. It's known as the natural resource damage component of liability, and it's to um, cover the damages or injury to the loss of the natural resources and the ecological services from that resource. And what I should stress again is that this is not the cleanup. Um, so who's responsible for what under these two bases of liability? Well, first, it's, it's worth noting that GE is financially responsible for everything. Um, but in terms of the, you know, overseeing the different portions of the liability uh, for the removal or the remedial action, that's going to be EPA. And as Abby described, EPA is sort of overseeing the cleanup now. That's the remedy action here. That's the, the, the remedial portion of the liability. Oversight for the natural resource damages, however, is not going to be EPA. This is instead going to be, um, with respect to the Hudson, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, NOAA, and the state of New York through DEC. So what is it that these trustees, in terms of, just to go into a little bit more depth on natural resource damages, what is it that these three trustees are calculating? Um, well, there are three main components of NRD, or natural resource damages. The first is restoration, and because as you can imagine, the minute you take some 
a toxic substance out of a resource, the resource just doesn't magically go back to normal. Um, so the polluter is responsible as a part of this overall NRD assessment to pay to restore the resource to baseline conditions. And what that, that means is the condition the resource would have been in were it not for the pollution. Um, the second major component is compensation for lost ecological services because while the resource is contaminated and sort of out of commission, there's all sorts of losses associated with that. Losses from not being able to use the resource and also damage to the resource itself. Um, back in the old days, this used to be a sort of an amount of money, uh, but compensation, this portion of the, the damages can take um, the form of restoration of equivalent resources or above sort of base conditions to compensate. Uh, it can take the form of access projects, so creating greater access to the site, you know, money for river walks or piers or um, different sorts of projects that provide use of the resource and use of those ecological services. Um, but of course, all of this also costs money. Um, and then last and probably least, um, are the assessment costs because as you can imagine, particularly with the Hudson River, assessing all of the damage that's done takes um, you know, money, it takes time, it takes people uh, measuring the damage and putting out reports. And in the case of the Hudson, even though this is maybe the smallest component of the NRD, it's not cheap here given the amount of damage done. Uh, so NRD, you may thought you didn't know much about it, but you probably know at least a little bit. If you've heard of the um, the settlement of the BP disaster in the Gulf, uh, BP settled all of its liability there for about 18 point something billion dollars. And of that liability, um, more than 8 billion of it was earmarked for natural resource damages. Um, so the only other site in the United States that's even close, the only other NRD site in the United States that's even close to being the same size as the Deepwater Horizon disaster is the Hudson River. And I should also point out, because of that second basis of liability, the compensation, the Hudson River is a much older Superfund site than the Deepwater Horizon. Um, and um, all, of, all of those years of loss are, should also be calculated in the ultimate damage assessment. Um, so Abby talked a little bit about the dangers of PCBs. Um, as we know, they cause all of these health problems. Um, and um, in case you want an example of uh, a visual example of sort of that last one, the skin and eye lesions or chloracne, um, whoops, this is a picture of um, the Yusho disaster in the 1960s when PCBs contaminated cooking oil in Japan um, and although it takes a larger doses of PCBs to, to show these sorts of effects, depending on the type of PCBs it may take no more than a gram. Um, but to understand what the natural resource damages are, that's sort of separate than the damage to human health. So to, to, to run through the damages that are going to be at issue in the NRD assessment, um, first you have to look at, well, what area are you talking about? So as Abby mentioned, only the upper Hudson, the upper 40 miles of the Superfund site is being remediated, but the Superfund site is 200 miles long and all of the damages within that site are going to be part of the NRD assessment and it's worth noting that PCBs are, are all the way south so much so that within New York Harbor area 74 percent of the PCBs are GE's PCBs when you and when you think of all the industry that is along the Hudson River um, and all of the other polluters as you move south that also dumped PCBs into the river that just shows you the magnitude of what GE dumped so, so we know the area that we're talking about, but what are the injured resources? Um, so as Abby mentioned, PCBs bioaccumulate um, in fish. Uh, they affect, um, you know, uh, 
fish and also the consumption of fish. So um, one of the damages that will be counted in this ultimate assessment is the damage to what's known as fishery resources. Um, so, um, and sort of the most salient point being here is that even to this day, the PCB contamination is so bad that um, the State Department of Health has advised that women under 50 and children under 15 never eat um, almost all of the species from the Hudson River. Um, and here's a picture of a man catching a fish uh, in Croton Point Park. Um, I don't see in that picture any health advisories, but the fact that, um, you know, he would be prohibited or he would be advised not to eat that fish, that's part of the damage that's within the scope of the natural resource damage assessment. Uh, some other damages, as Abby mentioned, the Champlain Canal, uh, which used to be a major commercial thoroughfare, is now shut down because of the presence of uh, well, it's shut down to major commercial traffic, deep draft commercial traffic. As you can see here, pleasure boats and smaller draft vessels can still move through, but it's essentially co closed to major commercial activity. That also is a damage that's also going to be calculated in the assessment. Um, damages to underground sources of drinking water. Um, the trustees just came out with a report last week um, you know, updating their assessment of the impact of groundwater resources. So the towns of, of Stillwater and um, I believe Fort Edward um, had their aquifers, their drinking water contaminated uh, because of the massive amounts of PCBs that are in the Hudson River. Um, also recreation. I mean, would you want to recreate next to, <laughs> next to um, a site or an area that had this warning sign? So the sort of the loss of recreation or the inability to use the Hudson River as a source of recreation, also part of that natural resource damage assessment. Um, and then, of course, there's the damage to wildlife itself. So you have um, damage to sort of cute animals such as waterfowl and mallards, uh, damage to less cute animals such as freshwater mussels, and then damage to really, really, really cute animals such as um, mink that live along the Hudson. And um, you know this particular mink right here, I'm not sure exactly uh, where he or she is from, but um, if it is from the Hudson River, you know, this, it, chances are that the concentration of PCBs in uh, its body is significantly elevated. So just to transition back to a quick talk about the remedy, as Abby mentioned, there are some huge problems with the remedy, and this is the cleanup. Um, and the trustees who are measuring the NRD damages said this about the remedy. They said that the elevated PCBs remaining in the surface sediment after the remedy will be the equivalent to a series of Superfund caliber sites left behind. And so that's not just one or two, but three or more, I assume a series being three or more, the equivalent of three or more Superfund sites being left in the Hudson. And this is after the, the current cleanup. And from their perspective, what this does, um, just sort of, you know, and again, this is a direct quote, the, the magnitude of contamination remaining post-dredging will likely make restoration of the uh, resources most impacted infeasible. Um, these statements are from 2011, but more recently uh, they've been saying some even more damning stuff. So this slide right here is actually from a NOAA presentation. It's not my slide, although I'll be using these little red circles to indicate some of the important information from their presentation. And here, the important thing I want to highlight is that this study is very, very recent. It's from this spring. And essentially what NOAA did is it went back and it looked at all of the computer modeling that EPA did for fish tissue back in 2002 and before to determine what sort of remedy they would choose, what sort of cleanup they would choose for the site. And um, and they re-ran some of the models 
with updated information and updated assumptions. So there's a couple of interesting conclusions that came from this new study. This And, and the first is right here. Um, and that's that EPA initially underestimated the amount of PCBs in the upper Hudson by a factor of two to three times. And not only did they underestimate the amount of PCBs in the upper Hudson by a factor of two to three times, they also assumed that PCBs would decay naturally at a rate of about 8% per year. Um, the actual observed rate um, that has been seen across the course of the cleanup is closer to 1.3%. So just to recap, they underestimated the amount of PCBs in the upper Hudson by two to three times, and they overestimated the amount of natural recovery by about six times. So um, taking that, NOAA reran some of the computer models or emulated computer models that EPA ran. And um, what they discovered, and this is a little bit tricky to understand, but the REM1 on the left-hand side, that is when EPA predicted the concentration of PCBs in white perch would be at 0.4. And Abby talked about concentrations earlier. 0.4 is where an adult male can eat a meal once every two months. The target is 0 0.05, so eight times less than that. Um, EPA predicted that at the end of the remedy, fish would already meet this concentration. With, a, with the rerun numbers that NOAA did, they, uh, they realized, and it's actually literally off the charts, um, that white perch are likely not to meet this concentration for 44 years. So just to emphasize, that's 44 years to get to a standard that's eight times higher than what EPA considered safe in 2002. And then there's some conclusions here, which are pretty easy to understand. Uh, NOAA concluded that original models were overly optimistic about the rate of recovery for surface sediment, um, and that additional removal of PCB contaminated sediment in the upper Hudson River is going to be needed to achieve the reductions in lower Hudson River fish than EPA initially anticipated back in 2002 when it selected the remedy. Um, so in terms of, so, so there's leftover uh, remedy, there's leftover PCBs in the Hudson River. What can we do about them? What are the different things that different actors can do? Well, one, uh, you know, EPA can expand the scope of the remedy. They can essentially tell GE, go back and clean up, or, or stay there, rather, and clean up more PCBs. Clean up these um, toxic hotspots, these Superfund equivalent sites. Um, short of that, GE is still on the hook for payment of these, you know, massive natural resource damages. So one thing that the trustees could do, they could order restoration dredging um, as one of the projects, one of the natural resource damage projects that GE would ultimately have to pay for, and that would be counted towards that NRD liability. Um, and then I guess GE could also sort of, you know, just do the additional cleaning out of the goodness of their heart, um, although that's, that's maybe less likely. Um, but what is, and just to sort of simplify things at the end of the day, what this means for New Yorkers, um, you know, there's, there's sort of three options with getting PCBs or, or addressing these remaining toxic hotspots in the upper Hudson. Um, Either GE can pay for it, either as part of the, an, uh, an expanded remedial action or through the NRD process. Um, the taxpayers can pay for it um, by the state doing its own dredging. Or uh, the PCBs can just stay in the river, um, you know, continuing to pose a threat to New Yorkers and also um, their use of the Hudson River and the whole um, also economic vitality of the Hudson Valley. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, uh, Joe Rapport, with a couple of things that people can do about this issue. Good afternoon. Uh, this is Joe Rapport. I'm working with Dan and Abby and several other people on the campaign. 
uh, to uh, uh, get GE uh, to do what we want them to do. Um, there's a slide up here that shows uh, some of the things you can do if you haven't signed on our, our online uh, uh, petition. Please go ahead and do that. The, uh, if you go to cleanerhudson.org, you can find a lot of this information. Um, but there's a, a petition that we're uh, sending to the uh, head of GE. We've tried a lot of different things. You know, so far we've gotten 80 municipalities to call on GE to do what it's supposed to do. We got a letter signed by 141 assembly members. That's out of 150. It's hard to get them to agree on anything other than letting uh, dogs uh, sit at outdoor cafes. So that was really extraordinary. We also got a letter uh, to the governor and also and to GE from 25 state senators. That's out of 63, so we didn't do as well. But it's really hard to get them to agree on anything. But still good. And we've gotten a lot of groups who have supported this. So if you're in a group uh, that uh, passes resolutions or sends letters, uh, you know, tell us, um, and I'll tell you how to do that. And we'll uh, make sure that it gets to Jeff, uh, Jeff uh, Immelt, the head of uh, GE. Um, we've got a couple other things uh, going on. Um, one is you can take a selfie or have somebody take a picture of you. Um, and uh, this is an example. You can write, I love the Hudson because, next to the Hudson, ideally. Um, we have a couple people here. And this is uh, happens to be my niece, anyway. Uh, she's a cutie. And she uh, took a ride on the on Amtrak, and she really looked, liked looking out at, at the, looking out the window at the river. So she decided to tell us. Um, so if you want to do that, we're trying to spread this on social media. We've gotten a bunch of these already. And the idea, especially with the uh, hashtags, restore our river from P, uh, PCBs, and, uh, uh, G, General Electric, and MY Governor uh, Gov, uh, Cuomo, and you can see on the bottom, uh, that's an effective way of, of getting uh, the word out. The world is a little different. You have to do more than get resolutions passed and so on. Uh, the other thing that uh, we're um, thinking of doing, and we'll go back to the slide, the next slide, yeah, there we are, uh, is uh, we are planning some on the ground uh, sorts of things, uh, really focusing on, on GE. Uh, maybe we'll go to a retail outlet where GE products are sold or a shareholders meeting, uh, we haven't quite figured that out. But if this is the kind of thing you like to do, we'd like to know about it. And you can, again, go to uh, uh, www.cleanerhudson.org, I left out the .org, I'm afraid, slash volunteer, um, and uh, tell us uh, that you're interested in helping. Um, and that's just a good way of communicating with us in any case if you have a question uh, that goes beyond you know, the discussion we're having today. Um, that's the kinds of things we're doing. We really need other people to help. We're a small band of people, and we represent a lot of people from the various groups that are part of this, including including NRDC and Riverkeeper, Scenic Hudson, and Clearwater. But we need some troops on the ground. So I think now we're going to see if there are any uh, questions that people have. Uh, as Dan has put up the uh, the uh, silhouette. Um, so if you have questions for us about anything that we're doing, uh, this is the time to ask. So this is Abby, and um, just a reminder that when if you do have a question, you just have to type it into your little chat box there and we'll see it. We already have a few questions coming in. And the first one is, um, just as there seems to be no requirement to post signs stating no swimming in contaminated areas of the Hudson. Why are there no requirements to post signs stating eat no fish? Swimming is one thing, but eating is extremely dangerous, no? So I'm gonna take a stab at answering that first question. Um, the Department of Health does post signs, um, fish consumption advisory signs, along the entirety of the Hudson River. Um, they try to locate them in areas that are known fishing spots, um, such as peers, and especially in the communities that are um, eating more of the fish as kind of a subsistence uh, fishery. Um, so they do post the signs, um, and unfortunately, uh, DOH might not be doing as good of a job as we would like them to, but they are out there. And in um, foreign-speaking communities, they do have these signs posted in different languages. 
Um, so if there is a watering hole near you where people are fishing and eating the fish, I would recommend you to call the Department of Health and let them know that perhaps this is one of those places where they should be doing a little more outreach and maybe post a sign there as well. So yeah, and um, yeah, and I would just say it's worth noting too that you know it's really all 200 miles of the Superfund site that are of concern uh, for fishing, and it's just hard to post that many signs in all of the places that people uh, can fish, which is one of the reasons it's so important just to get the PCBs out of the river in the first place. Right, and I just want to clarify one more thing on that question is you mentioned about swimming. Um, it's perfectly safe to swim in the river um, as far as PCBs are concerned. Uh, we do recommend that you don't cut, touch contaminated sediment, and that's where some of the issues with the restoration projects are coming into play. Um, just make sure you shower. It's really other issues uh, that affect the Hudson River that you need to be concerned about with swimming. So moving on to the next question, and this is one that, that's going to be related to Stan's presentation. So in so far, as we're talking about the natural resource damages assessment, can you please talk about quote unquote grossly disproportionate relative to what? Yeah, so so I was wondering if we would get a question on that because I know it's it's on the the presentation it was on the, the slide but not um, I didn't explain it. So there is a, a circumstances when the benefit of the restored resource would or the costs rather of restoring the resource would be grossly disproportionate to the benefit of the restored resource and in that case uh, what a polluter can do is pay for replacement of the damaged resources rather than restoration. Um, the only couple of things to say about that there is that restoration is strongly preferred because we don't like to just give up on resources um, and also that the benefits here that could be unlocked by a cleaner Hudson and also the demonstrated ability of GE to do this dredging, um, I think would make that not applicable in the current case, although I'm sure GE would, would disagree. OK. Um, moving on to the next question. Is there anything that we can do about the fact that GE has started removing its dredging equipment? Um, I'm going to take the first time at answering this question and open it up to Dan, especially Joe. But I know that Riverkeeper in particular and Phoenix Hudson and a few of the other organizations have sent out um, electronic email blasts with sample letters. And I think you can find that on our website as well, where you can actually send a letter to EPA, to the Regional Administrator, Judith Inc., and also to the federal U.S. EPA Administrator in D.C., uh, Gina McCarthy, letting them know that w they need to stop allowing GE um, from dismantling their equipment um, until we figure all this out. So um, I don't know if Dana can provide with that link, but if you go to our Riverkeeper website or if you follow up um, with me, I can be sure to send you that information. Um, I don't know if Dan or Joe has anything to add. Yeah, the only thing I, say, I would say is uh, obviously we're trying to uh, make sure that ultimately, you know, GE is responsible for this. We know that. And a, a big focus of the work that we're going to do in terms of organizing um, and pressure will be on GE over the next several months, as it has been over the last uh, months as well. At the same time, you know, we've got a, a governor who could play a role. Uh, the state of New York is one of the three uh, official trustees for the river, and they take a look at uh, uh, damages, and they'll determine how much a GE has to uh, fork over and whether GE has to do more uh, work, more dredging work. Um, so, you know, the governor is now wooing GE to come to New York, and uh, there have been several articles that have made it clear that, well, that's nice. Um, but at the same time, maybe uh, the governor should include as a part of any deal he makes with GE if he does get to the point where they are uh, seriously interested in coming to New York State, that uh, the cleanup continues as well. 
Um, so we're going to continue to focus on GE, uh, but obviously if EPA isn't doing what we'd like or the governor um, or other uh, players, we're going to put pressure on them as well. Okay, great. Um, the next question we have is, can you describe the number of communities, the entire graphic scope of the site that will be a part of the NRD compensation process? I think, Dan, that's probably a good one for you to tackle. Yeah, I mean, it's so, it, it's it's a little bit tricky, and it, it also depends in, in terms of where we are in the NRD process. So there's sort of a, a three different process, three different parts of the NRD process. First, what the trustees do is they determine what was injured, what resources were injured. Uh, the second part is once they've determined what's injured, they determine how badly it was injured. And then the third part is they um, either come up with a list, they either come up with a number in terms of the total damage amount, or they come up with a list of projects that um, are, are uh, you know, will compensate for those losses or will affect uh, restoration. So now we're still in sort of the damage assessment phase, and I think, um, you know, determining which communities are included in that NRD process is sort of in step two, determining how bad the damage is. Um, there's sort of two different ways that, that you can rack up natural resource damages. Um, you know, one is injury to the resource itself, and that's sort of less dependent on how many people and what communities live around the Hudson. That's sort of the damage to the wildlife, to the plant life, um, you know, and that's, you know, the size, the 200 mile size of the river is going to factor into that, but less so the communities around it. But the other component of NRD is our use of this natural resource, our use of these, you know, what are called ecological services. And so those communities, all of the communities along the Hudson, I think would be included in that assessment. And it's worth noting that there are some very, very populous communities, um, you know, for example, the largest city in the United States that are right along uh, the Hudson River. And all of that is going to factor into that part of the NRD assessment. Okay, great. Thanks, Dan. Um, let me try to pull up another question here. What were the sorts of errors that were made that enabled the bad estimates of fish contamination and PCG breakdown? Um, I think this question goes to the NOAA study, Dan, that you mentioned. So I don't know if you want to take a stab at that first. Sure, yeah, and just to sort of reemphasize the, the points that this study um, you know, made are the two big points. Um, I think part of it was, you know, we just didn't have the sort of sampling data that we have today back in 2002. So sort of from 2002, you know, all the way, you know, through um, I think 2012 or 2014, or maybe even to the present day, core samples have been taken of the upper Hudson River. So we have a much better idea of the amount of PCBs that are in the river or were in the river at the time than EPA did in 2002. So, you know, the first part is, you know, EPA, I suppose, just didn't have enough data back in 2002 to know that there were way, way, way more PCBs up there than they had ever imagined. Um, the other, uh, the other main conclusion was that, you know, EPA, when it was doing computer modeling, basically they were doing, they were like seeing how much how many PCBs were in the sediment and then sort of running a computer model based on certain assumptions to see or to predict rather how many PCBs will be left in the fish after the completion of the remedy. Um, as part of that modeling, one of the assumptions they had, they just assumed that PCBs would decay at a rate of 8% a year. But you know, we've actually measured this over the course of the cleanup, and you know, as it showed on the chart, um, the the observed rate of decay naturally, you know, it was is around 1.3 percent, which is um, six times lower than what EPA had assumed um, back in the early 2000s. And one of the things, Dan, I I'm sorry, I'm 
from the beginning of what you said, but one of the things that I kind of mentioned in my presentation too is that once GE got in and started dredging, they realized that the depths of contamination and the areas of contamination and the levels of PCB were much higher than they initially had, uh, than their sampling had shown and that they had modeled. So that, um, that's another area where, you know, putting in bad data results in a bad, bad model and bad estimate. Yeah, and, and I think that's an important point to stress. You know, we've learned a lot more over the course of this dredging, and what we've learned is this, is this is a site that's way, way more contaminated than anyone ever thought. And you would assume that in response to that contamination or the fact that it's worse than anybody thought, that you would revise the actions you take to make sure that we're addressing all of this additional contamination. But unfortunately, that's just not what has been done. Mm -hmm. Great. So the next question has to deal with um, GE's estimated financial liability. The question is, the BP liability was stated as being $18 billion. What is the estimated financial liability of GE for the Hudson? So it's a little tricky, and this is where you have to get a little bit more into the weeds. So, you know, the, the BP site was under the Oil Pollution Act. It wasn't actually under CERCLA, although natural resource damages are a component of both acts, and they're calculated the same way. Um, there were other components of liability there in the $18 billion, eighteen plus billion dollar settlement. Um, and, and as I mentioned in the presentation, um, and you can look back at the slide later, only eight you know, about 8.4 billion of that was for natural resource damages related to the site. So what EPA, uh, sorry, what GE is on the hook for is the natural resource damage component of their Superfund liability. Um, and like I said, you know, it's, it's at this point the liability and all of the, you know, the numbers and the studies and, and the math are is being crunched by the trustees um, and we don't have full access to that information but just sort of extrapolating from other NRD sites across the country including the Deepwater Horizon I mean this is just a huge site this is a huge site with a huge amount of resources damaged and they've been damaged for a really really long time and all of that is included in the NRD so it wouldn't be surprising to have an NRD assessment somewhere in the billions of dollars. So the next question, I know we're getting almost to 2 o'clock here, but the next question kind of deals with um, more of a general question that I think might be a good one. Um, do you think that GE is seemingly projecting that they did a thorough job, especially to those south of the Troy Dam? And I'm just going to answer this briefly and then let Dan kind of um, go off on what I say as well, but we know that GE is claiming that this is a successful cleanup and their um, spokespeople are saying repeatedly that, quote unquote, they are doing 100% of the job that EPA has assigned them to do. Um, and that's a very misleading, very misleading statement. It totally dismisses any potential liability that GE would have, as Dan has detailed in depth about natural resource damages liability. It totally dismisses any potential liability that GE may have to the state of New York for the contaminations in the Champlain Canal. Um, so they are projecting that they're doing a great job. They're doing everything that they're required to do. Um, and whether or not that's true, whether or not they're meeting the goals of the remedial action and the 2002 agreement with EPA, it doesn't dismiss the fact that they're leaving behind not only the 35% of the PCBs that we knew from the beginning that they were going to be leaving behind, but we now know that there are even more PCBs in the river than they initially expected. They're leaving an additional 136 acres at least behind that will severely contaminate the Hudson River and the fish, and that they are totally discounting the fact that they have additional liability hanging out there that we're concerned about, that our communities are concerned about, that our economies are concerned about, and frankly that some of their shareholders are being concerned about. 
Yeah, it's it's just to sort of uh, you know add a silly metaphor here. When I think about the liability, or when I think about the cleanup, and what GE says about the cleanup, I'm reminded of a child maybe that uh, you know makes a mess in the kitchen. Let's say with like spaghetti sauce or something, spills a huge amount of spaghetti sauce all over the kitchen, and then gets like spaghetti sauce all over their feet and, and like tracks spaghetti sauce through the rest of the house and you know, in the bedrooms and just really all over the place. I mean, we're talking spaghetti sauce all over the house. You know, if the child then comes back and cleans up just the kitchen and does a really good job, is it, I don't think any parent would say, well, that's, that's sufficient. You know, we have, you know, spaghetti sauce all over the couch, but because you did a really good job in the kitchen, you've satisfied your responsibility here. Um, although that's exactly kind of what GE is saying. They're saying, look, we, we cleaned up this limited amount of PCBs in just the upper Hudson. That's all we're legally required to do. Isn't that a great job? And I think the answer we should all say is, is the same thing we'd say to that child is, no, of course not. You have to clean, you, you, you have to clean up all of it. You're responsible for all of it. Um, and that's what we should be saying to GE. Okay, so it's it's two o'clock, um, so we're not going to be answering any more questions. But if you have any that you feel you really want an answer to that hasn't been covered either in this presentation or in some of the links that Dana sent to you, um, just um, email Dana at dgully g u l l e y at super dot org, and we'll do our best to answer those as quickly as possible. And so Dana just sent that up. And um, I guess without, um, is, is Joe or Dan, do you have any closing remarks that you'd like to put out there? Um, no, just visit uh, cleanerhudson.org and uh, sign up. Okay. Great. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Thanks, all. Bye-bye.